There are some pretty great show moments out here. I forgot about Kenny chugging the bourbon was an all timer. That was good too. No, that was good. Made it. That was good. Oh, we determined Maddie McQueen is a, a, a the, the birth of Maddie McQueen was a top five, uh, or t- certainly a top ten D'Lo and Casey moment as we welcome in our good friend Matt George of uh, ABC Ten and of course the Locked On Kings podcast. Uh, Matt, last night's game was everything we hope tonight's game will be. Mm, please, wow. what do you what's what's working for this team right now? It, because last night's game aside, it feels like overall, even against the Raptors slash Bucks slash Lakers slash Timberwolves, the Kings are playing really, really good ball in the month of March. Yeah, the I mean, Mike Brown likes to break his season down into five game mini seasons. And this five game mini season for the Sacramento Kings has been absolutely tremendous to where they've held their opponents under 100 points, three out of the five games. They've scored 120 or more points four out of the five games. They're a plus 17 in terms of point differential. They're averaging 116 points per game uh, and are giving up only 99 points per game. That's absolutely absurd over this five game stretch. But like you said, it, it extends out to the month of March as a whole. And I think a lot of people rightfully so are recognizing that Keon Ellis is a massive part of the change, especially on the defensive end of the floor. And they're right. But I think it goes a step further. Mike Brown figured out how to maximize his roster better. And he did so with these three guard lineups that we're seeing. The three guard lineups to me have unlocked the potential for Sacramento to play to a higher level because you're you're staggering and balancing any combination of Fox, Monk, Keegan, or sorry, Keon, Kevin Herter when he was healthy, and even Davion Mitchell to some extent, to where you're getting a lot out of guys that you were only getting a little bit from, and they're able to stay on the court consistently enough to give you the best of what they have to offer. Davion Mitchell, we were not able to see the off-night defense that Davion Mitchell brings to the table because offensively, he didn't necessarily fit. He'd have a couple good moments, but offensively, they're just it wouldn't click there, so the balance wasn't worth it. Well, by staggering him with a Malik or with a Fox or keeping Sabonis out there and even putting Keon and, and Davion at the floor at the same time and not putting so much offensive expectation on Davion or Keon, but allowing them to score within the flow of the offense, which is the good looks that they're going to get, and then make their impact on the defensive end. To me, Mike's uh, figuring out how to put these three guard lineups out there and for it to improve them defensively, not knock them back, and also not drag the offense down too much while keeping a Sabonis and a Barnes or a a Sabonis and a Keegan or Keegan and Barnes, whoever it may be out there with them to kind of provide that size and that length that this Kings team needs. I think that has unlocked so much of what we're seeing right now and has led to Keon being being recognized more and Davion becoming a solidified part of the rotation now, which was a major question mark as early as a month ago. Those three guard lineups to me have been the key. So Matt, I know you're one of the guys who have been on the Davion needs to start or Davion needs just be consistently in the rotation. Uh, I, mean, I mean, David, oh, another well, day, yeah, another no, miss. Yeah. Like Davion, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> no, it's all right. The week's almost over. I've, I've not been on that train, buddy. Okay. No, not that train. I love Davion, yeah. not that train. No. Not the Kenny, it's fine. It's okay. Choo-choo. Friday, the doctor is on the phone. He really needs you to come back to the doctor's office. Thanks, JB. Thanks, JB. <laughs> Yeah, Keon is who I was talking about. That's why I said you've been big on Keon being a, a major player in the rotation and even starting. And I was a little slow to get there. And, and to be honest with you, to be fair, if Kevin wouldn't have gotten hurt, I still wouldn't have made that change. Mm-hmm. But the other day watching the uh, game against the Grizzlies and what he did to Desmond Bain, I was just floored. You know, and it's not – that wasn't the first time he's done it. He's been doing it, but I was a little slower to the party than everybody else. And I don't know if you heard, Matt, but I had an epiphany. Mm. I had an epiphany. I said Keon Ellis can be an all-NBA defender in this league. He is that level of defender. Some of the things – the blocks that he was having, I mean, it just – it was an epiphany. It literally was – I was sitting there, I was like, oh, I see what the Matt Georges and everybody else were talking about. Did I go a little overboard 
was saying he can be that type of defender, or do you feel the same way about Keon? I mean, if he keeps putting up two to four steals a game and anywhere between one to that five block game that he had the other night, I mean, those absolutely, that's getting you in the all defensive numbers. And I'll be completely honest with you, Kenny. Like, as much as I was a, a pro Keon Ellis being uh, in, in the starting lineup, I'm not, I wasn't expecting him to be this good as he's even been in the week since we last had our conversation. Now, uh, one thing you said there that I absolutely agree with, if if Kevin Herter were healthy, he'd still be starting right now. Like Mike, Mike has made that perfectly clear, whether I agreed with it or disagreed with it. And I do want to say like, this is not the way that any of us should have wanted Keon to get the spot. I've seen the jokes. I've seen the comments like, and this is in the greater good of the Sacramento Kings. No, it's not. You're a worse basketball team with Kevin Herter likely being out for a significant period of time. You're a worse basketball team. What I liked was the idea of Keon Ellis starting and then Kevin Herter getting that green light, freedom, shooting, scoring punch off of the bench and being able to stagger him the same way Mike has been staggering other guards throughout the last couple of weeks or throughout the last month. So I'm not celebrating Keon starting because of the circumstance. I'm happy he's getting that opportunity, and I'm happy that we're going to see it in an extended stretch, but the circumstances of how he got there are, are not anything to, to be proud of or thankful for. But Keon is, I mean, Mike Brown said it phenomenally last night. Like he plays like a, a veteran. He plays like an old soul in the defensive end. He's so smart. He's, I mean, even a play last night, like um, the, the, the Raptors switched Kelly Olenek onto Keon and tried to post him up. And Keon denied him any room, didn't let him back him down into the paint, slipped around him, and intercepted the inbounds pass uh, that was intended to go over the top of Keon uh, to enter into the post. Keon just steps in front, picks it out of the air like it was absolutely nothing, like it was a routine play and goes back the other way. Those are moves that, like, in the grand scheme of things, you're like, oh, that was a neat moment. But in reality, it's like that is a savvy play by a second-year player who really is getting his first consistent NBA shot, period. Like, it's one thing to talk about. Look at Keegan Murray's growth defensively awesome Keegan Murray's what he's, he's probably close to 100 career basketball games played at this point now Keon is nowhere near that so Keon has an instinct an elite defensive instinct that makes me believe that he he's finally given the Kings what they've been looking for for not just the last two seasons for basically 20 years on the perimeter defensively plus you have De'Aaron Fox and Davion Mitchell could provide more for you plus you have Keegan Murray in addition to that there's no re reason to go back to your question Kenny that if, if this trajectory continues and Keon continues to to get the playing time and be that impactful defender, especially if he can do that on the playoff stage, yeah, people are going to start talking to him, talking about him as someone who whose ceiling is an all-defensive type player. Uh, Matt, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Kevin Herter. I feel, uh, one, like a jerk, two, like a bad radio show host. We should have started with Kevin Herter, as that's pretty immediate news. Uh, for many and some on the radio who may just be tuning in, Kevin Herter, uh, dislocated short, shoulder, torn labrum, no treatment plan yet set in place by Kevin Herter or by the Sacramento Kings. That's something they're going to evaluate in the coming days. He is not on this road trip. Obviously, he's not going to play tonight. He's not going to play Saturday. Probably safe to guess he's not going to play anytime soon. It really just boils down to whether he has surgery, is his season over, and what this means moving forward. But when you got the news, uh, the official news uh, regarding Kevin Herter from the Sacramento Kings, your initial thoughts were what? Just feeling bad for him because regardless of how, how well it's worked or not, and I've been critical of, of Kevin, I think I said it on your show literally last week, Kevin has been putting in the work, but he just is, has not been able to do the job defensively. He just hasn't been able to do the job. And I, and it's not that he is taking plays off. Absolutely. He's fighting. He is battling. He just does not have the skill set, the ability, the athleticism, whatever it may be. He has not been able to consistently do the job that Mike Brown has been asking and specifically what the Sacramento Kings have been needing to play the defense to the level that they're capable of the level that we've been seeing at least over these past five games. So, I, my initial reaction was, man, this, this sucks for, for a guy who still, I think had so much to offer the Kings and their incoming playoff run, of course, assuming they, they make the playoffs, which most likely they will. But like that, that was my first thought is, is this confirms that we're in many ways getting what we wanted with Keon starting. 
but ultimately it makes the Sacramento Kings worse. And I'm not going to speculate on how much time. It seems like in some ways the ball is in Kevin's court and his camp's court about what route they want to take. Kevin is under contract for, I think, another two years after this year. So he does not have to rush and he does not have to push anything to come back. It's not like, knock on wood, this was an injury to Malik Monk on a contract year where something could be significantly costing him money or anything like that. So patience can be on Kevin's side. I've questioned what Kevin Herter's future is like here in Sacramento. I've said before, I don't expect him to be a King next year. I have no idea if this injury changes that in any, any facet, but for the immediate future, future, the Sacramento Kings got worse and a great teammate and a hard worker is not able, able to provide his services for the Kings. So it's a loss. I feel terrible for Kevin. We've talked about it. We all don't feel the same way. I don't want to speak for you, Matt, but I know how you feel. I feel terrible for him, man. And um, it was just a rough season, just a rough professional season. And for to um, at least uh, we don't want to speculate, may, maybe he's able to come back, but at the very least, something that you have to deal with this season, an injury like that. Uh, I just feel, feel bad for the guy, man. And I, I'm with you, Matt. Um, even if he, should have been a starter, or should have, whatever the case may be. You want a guy like that on your team, in your rotation. He's still a rotational player for a playoff team. And not having him there, um, it, it hurts. It hurts. So, um, yeah, I, I feel terrible for Kevin, man. And like you said, it seems like it's in his court. Um, hopefully, hopefully can something can be worked out where he plays this year. That's – that's what I'm still hoping for until they say otherwise. Never is best for him. Yeah, and I mean, you think to the postseason, too. You think back to the postseason last year. Kevin struggled to, to give the Kings an impact, but you now are down, assuming, or I have no idea if he's going to miss the playoffs or not, but let's say he does. You're down another scoring and shooting threat to where we know how much the Kings have felt like at times live and die by the three-point shot. Anytime you can have another shooter out there to where if Keegan's having a bad night, maybe Fox isn't hitting threes and, and and the Kings are going through one of those slumps and game whatever of a playoff series, Kevin Herter can be one of those guys that in an instance, it doesn't have to be for a full game. He doesn't have to go for a 40-point explosion like Keegan did earlier this season. But for one quarter, when you're in the midst of a slump and you can't score and Kevin Herter comes in and knocks down two or three straight threes to give you some energy, get you back into the game and, and kind of tread water until the rest of the stars kind of wake up a little bit, that's what you're losing. That's what you're missing. It's it's you, you can it's an, a cliche like it's a good problem to have for a coach to have too many weapons and only so many time to put them in. But especially during a playoff series when you're it's essentially a seven game chess match or a best best of seven chess match, you just had a piece taken off the board, a piece that can be much more valuable than a pawn. Yeah, and it's it puts a lot of pressure. It, he was brilliant last night, and this is great news for the Sacramento Kings. We talk about Keon Ellis. This was kind of Keon Ellis and, and, and Kevin Herter and how you manage those two. Now you have a, a player completely out of the equation, which is where Chris Duarte comes in. Yeah. Now you've got like added pressure on Chris Duarte to contribute offensively and defensively when he comes into the game. It's a tough spot for a lot of people. Chris was brilliant last night. Duarte was absolutely brilliant last night. He was. Um, he's playing, and he's he, been and, playing and that, really well. And that's the other thing. He has been playing well. The Kings have been playing well. And, Matt, I'll ask you this. Are the Sacramento Kings better defensively? Do you feel like the Sacramento Kings are now a better, or at least are playing like a better defensive team than they have through the first couple of months of the season? This is the best version of this Sacramento Kings team that we have seen, period. This is it. Like over this two year, like this is the best basketball that they've been playing. Because even if offensive, like the offense, what's exciting is the offense can still be better. Like during this five game mini series or mini season that I was talking about, the Kings are shooting like 36% from three point range. That can get better. 80% from the free throw line. That can get better. Like their rebounding has been a little bit down compared to what it was earlier on in the season. This Kings team can still get better. But while the defense has significantly improved, the offense is still around that 116 point per game mark, which was their average last season when they were number one offense in the league. So what this five game stretch is telling me, granted with different opponents, not against the same opponent like you would face in a playoff series, but this five game stretch has shown me that the Kings are capable of playing physical, impactful defense without 
sacrificing too much on the offensive end like Mike Brown has believed and Mike Brown has talked about. The exception is that one loss where the Kings played really good defense and held the Knicks to, what, 98 points, and offensively they only scored 93. That game in itself gave me flashbacks and deja vu to the playoffs, and that was exactly what the Kings struggled with. They played great defense against the Warriors, couldn't hit water if they fell out of the boat offensively throughout that series. So we can look at and hyper-focus on that one game, but in reality, these five games as a whole have shown us that Sacramento can consistently play well on the defensive end, consistently play physical, still score, still get their offensive rhythm. And anyone who wants to roll their eyes and go, it's only a five-game sample size, it's been a long time, a long time since the Kings have been able to string together two or three straight good defensive performances, let alone five, right? This is If we're talking about a best-of-seven series, five-sevenths of the series you've shown that you can be this team, you're going to win a lot of series if this is who you who you truly are and who you're capable of, uh, of being. You're going to make it a difficult out for anybody in the Western Conference, even the teams like the Pelicans or the Clippers that match up-wise you should be a little bit afraid of. I think this is the best version that we've seen of this Kings team so far. The question is, though, not so much can they sustain it, but how do teams adapt to it? Because like I talked about, Mike has figured something out with these three guard lineups. But when he gets into a chess match with whoever it may be in the playoffs or even before that, back-to-back games against the Dallas Mavericks coming up, if I recognize it, they damn sure recognize it. When other teams start throwing a wrench in those plans or trying to adjust and adapt and take something away, can the Kings still be the same? Or does Mike have to kind of backtrack and refigure that out? But it's, it's good to have more options. Here's the thing about that, Matt, and you're 100% right, but I'm trying to think about, all right, how do we, if you're you're going up against them, how do you um, combat what the Kings are doing? And the X factor, once again, is Keon, in my opinion, because, once again, not trying to disrespect or throw shade to anybody, but it is what it is. Keon's not Anthony Roberson. He's not Tony Allen. He's not a guy that you can stick the center on and they can roam around and not have to guard him. If you leave him open from three, He'll knock down the shot. So if you're, okay, well, they don't have Herter on there, so we can leave Keon and go help on Domas or go help on Fox or anything else like that. Leave him open if you want to. He'll he'll knock down a catch-and-shoot jumper. Fox talked about how he's a dead-eye shooter out there in practice. So I, 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 there's obviously some answer that some team will have or whatever, but the first the first thought would be that. Like, hey, leave the, the young fellow open and, and help on other – no, I don't know if you can do that. I don't know if you can do that. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, the, the easy answer is force Keon Ellis to beat you. Force Davion Mitchell to beat you. If they do, tip your cap, right? And uh, But, like, I, I don't know how teams can, can fully stop or fully slow down the Sacramento Kings. I mean, the one thing that's worked during this five-game miniseries is have a a superstar that can go for 40 and then have a, a good defense that can just try and limit the Sacramento Kings as much as possible. I mean, I think it's, it, it's also simple. have a crew of an officials that are really wow. willing to just not, well, you know, and you might see that in the postseason. Yeah. That's just, yeah. Facts. Mike, I, I think Mike has also kind of made the blueprint known of this is how we don't play our best basketball. And it has everything to do offensively with paint touches and spray threes. Right. Do you not do not let like let the Sacramento Kings shoot themselves out of a ball game by taking the wrong shots compared to the shots that they want to take. Like mm-hmm. it's you can't it's not possible to say, hey, stop De'Aaron Fox from getting downhill. OK, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> like st- yeah. stop DeMondis Sabonis from getting his spot in the high post. OK, like it's, it's easy to say in reality, you're, you're not doing that. Certainly not consistently over a playoff series. But if you can congest the paint think about what the rockets did think about what the 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 the, um the knicks just did think about what the warriors did a lot during the playoffs if you can congest the paint and make it not just difficult for the kings to pass out of the paint but make De'Aaron know and sabonis know and whoever attacks the basket malik know that if they come in there they're gonna things are gonna get physical Mm -hmm. maybe that changes and rattles the kings a little bit when the, the kings are at their best when they're getting downhill and then kicking out to those spray threes that mike brown likes so much and then the, the blueprint of beating the Sacramento Kings on the defensive end of the floor is just hitting your shots, right? Space the floor, knock down your threes. Because the Kings, Mike Brown has pointed this out, if the Kings were league average defensively from the perimeter, they'd be a top 10 defense in the league. And they've been doing a significantly better job recently 
holding their opponents to, to lower three point shooting percentages. That has a lot to do with the high five closeouts that Mike has talked a lot about, but a blueprint of beating the Sacramento Kings and breaking them down is space the floor and knock down open shots because at some point the Kings are going to give them to you. Uh, from the Kings, some I'm a little bit surprised by Sasha Vazenkov is out tonight. Mm. I thought for sure he'd be back. Um, but he's not. Uh, Sasha Vazenkov is out uh, tonight versus Washington. Of course, the Kings are in Orlando on Saturday, and they'll be back home to take on the Philadelphia 76ers on Monday. Um, okay. Uh, I thought for sure he would be back uh, tonight, given the, seem- the fact that uh, everything seems to be trending towards his return. Uh, but not yet, Matt. Sasha's got an uphill climb ahead of him. And I, I think something that might be working in his favor with the return from this injury is, is Trey Lyles being out. Mm-hmm. But Sasha was already behind the eight ball a little bit, even as a veteran player from Europe. Just, I mean, we saw even when he was making impactful plays, how short of a leash that he had or how limited his opportunities were as the Kings are ramping up towards the playoffs and starting to play their best basketball. And he has not been a part of that, not just during this stretch. He has not been a part of the Kings for 16 games or something like that now. Like, it's not necessarily being left in the dust. It's just the Kings finally finding out what is the best version of themselves. And he can't be a part of it because he can't play. Like, that's – and and you best believe when Trey Lyles comes back, even with Trey Lyles missing an extended period of time, Trey's one of those people that I think Mike has enough trust in that, yep, you're right back into the playoff rotation, buddy. Get right back in there. You're too important. Right? And at that point, it's, okay, maybe Len takes a step back. Maybe Duarte, to some extent, takes a step back. Sasha is one of those guys where – like, I'm not saying he's he's becoming an afterthought, but th- his injury might be more significant to him than it actually is to the Kings because they're, they're finding out what they need to do without him. And offensively, they're not stepping back while defensively improving. And Sasha is a guy that, for the most part, is going to give you an offensive boost over a defensive boost. So even if he was available tonight, guys, I don't know if he would play unless Sacramento got to a point where they were up big in the fourth quarter again, which they absolutely should. Um, but I, I don't know, even when Sasha comes back, I'm not rooting against him because he can absolutely provide some of that three point shooting that you're now lacking with Kevin Herter being out. I don't know how Sasha works his way back into any sort of consistent rotational spot this late in the season with the playoffs right around the corner that he has zero playoff experience in, by the way. Yeah. But I still feel like they they may need some size and, and need some bodies if Trey Lyles is out there. So like you mentioned, I think earlier, that's the main thing. Yeah, by virtue of the fact that Trey Lyles is out, you got to give him a look, you know, and give him you know maybe an extended look to to see you know what he can do out there because there's going to be some times in there. As much as we love the way these guys are playing right now, you, you may need a stretch four. You may need a bigger six eight six nine tight body to to defend or help defend or anything else like that um and just give him a look give him a chance and, and matt you hit it on the head if trey Lowes is there he might not see the floor but unfortunately he's not so just by virtue of that you, you may have to at least try to see him out there but i mean even even if trey Lowes is out for an extended period of time and hey stealing a line from damien's book here i'm just a broadcast journalist just asking a question here like what would you rather have would you rather have a stagger of Barnes and Keegan playing and providing that stretch four for you at pretty much all times with an Alex Len out there filling those DeMontis Sabonis less minutes. And Alex Len is a trusted part of my, what Mike Brown does. Alex doesn't necessarily play every single night, but when Alex Len plays, good things happen. He, he has impactful minutes in short stretches. He's always ready to go. And he did that in the playoffs last year against the Golden State Warriors too. So knowing Mike that's going to be the card that Mike pulls well before the Sasha Vizenkov uh, card. Maybe you give it a look from time to time, but again, I'm feeling like that's more of a garbage time look or a limited set. There's 10 seconds left. The shot clock is off at the end of the third quarter coming out of a timeout. You just want to get a quick bucket. Okay, get Sasha out there. Same way like on defense. Okay, it's get Kessler Edwards out there. Like maybe that's the scenario, but I think at this point in time, Mike would be more solidified in his, okay, we're missing Trey Lyle. If Sasha's back, that's great. We have that option. But I'm staggering Keegan and Harrison at that four spot, having one of them on the floor at all times. 
And then it's Len coming in when Sabonis needs the breather. That's a good point. Matt, do the Sacramento Kings have three legitimate defenders right now in Keon, Keegan, and De'Aaron? I think they have two elite defenders and one that can be elite. Not, I wouldn't say when he wants to be because I don't think that's fair. I'd say when the time calls for it. Because I think Is that De'Aaron? That's De'Aaron. Okay. I think De'Aaron can be elite and has shown his ability to be elite. But a big part of why Keon has helped the Kings so much, and Mike has talked about this too, is that you can stick Keon on. And I, I, I alluded to this in last night's podcast, like revisionist history here. But imagine if you had seven games of Keon Ellis, your job is to chase Steph Curry and make his life as difficult as possible. I'm not saying Steph doesn't go for 50 in game seven because it's Steph freaking Curry. And we saw what Jalen Brunson did at times to Keon, right? So those players are just different. That's a tough test to ask. But if you take a, a significant amount of that pressure off of De'Aaron Fox and even off of Davion Mitchell to some extent, right? How much different does that series look? Thinking like projecting forward, Keon Ellis is the that elite guard defender that can take on the bulk of those defensive responsibilities so that De'Aaron can do his thing on the offense and be as impactful as we know he is on that end of the floor while being a good off-ball defensive option. And then if it comes down to crunch time and Keon's not having a good game, so you decide, hey, put Fox and Malik out there to close this thing down. Okay, now Fox, you're on Steph. Or now Fox, you're on the elite guard. You're on Jamal Murray in a, in a Nugget series. Go and figure that out. But at that point, you're getting Fox being elite and giving his all in defense for five minutes instead of 35. So I think the Kings absolutely have three. You might, if if Davion gets the consistent opportunity, Davion is also up there as a, as a above average defender. And so three of your best defenders in theory are at the guard position and are on the perimeter. And perimeter defense has been a bane of this Kings organization for a very, very long time. I could be overreacting to a five-game sample size, and I probably am to a little bit, Kenny, going back to your point about, like, we're talking about Keon as an all-defensive player at this point. But I think the Kings have four guys now that Mike is finding a way to consistently get playing time that can make big defensive plays. And I don't know if we could say that for more than two guys going into the playoffs last year. Maybe just one, and that was Fox. I'm the early 2000s Pistons just emerging right here in Sacramento. <laughs> Keon is Tayshawn Prince. Yeah, man. <laughs> Can't wait for those 69, 67 games Nick. in the whole Who's Rashid? Malik. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that works. Yeah. Speaking of Malik, obviously, with the way he's been playing and Anthony Slater's article um, over at The Athletic, it's been the topic of conversation all week long and uh, a lot of talk on whether or not um, he's going to be able to or the Kings are going to be able to keep him here in Sacramento long term. i to ask you, Matt, what you think, man? How are you feeling today? This is probably a very unhealthy way to, to live life and go through life. Every day we get closer to the end of the season is every day we get closer to the fear of or, or of, of go time for the Kings with Malik. I've said this before on your show. I'll say it again. I don't think there's a player in this league realistically that the Kings can go out and acquire regardless of the financial situation that gives you and replaces what Malik Monk does for this team. I don't think it exists. Malik is priority one a through Z, right? He finding out how to keep Malik in a Kings uniform. If that is the only thing that the Kings do this off season, I wouldn't necessarily call it a successful off season. Cause it'd be kind of a copy and paste the last off season, but the, the one thing the Kings, I don't think can survive and afford to do is let Malik go or lose Malik. Now I know financially contractually collective bargaining agreement. There's only so much that they can do. There's certain circumstances uh, there's there's teams out there like the Orlando Magic, for example, that I think will have Malik in their crosshairs and will be paying close attention. And maybe they go crazy and throw the bag at, at Monk. I love what Monk said in that article with Slater that he, he would love to stay here in Sacramento. I also read it for what it is. He's not committing to Sacramento like Trey Lyles did last offseason. Trey Lyles basically said at the end of last season, like, I want to come back here. I don't want to be anywhere else. Malik Monk was saying, yeah, I'd love to remain a Sacramento King. 
But you best like Malik, his value is never going to be higher than it is right now. He's a runner. That's what he should do. That's a hundred percent how he should approach this. hundred percent. The city loves him. He loves the city. His best friend is here. He has a great relationship with Mike Brown. Even if those two will go at each other more than anybody else on this team, they have a very big, a clear trust in, in each other. And they are bonded through their desire to win and be the best version of themselves and, and bring this team as far as they can go. Like there's so many reasons why Malik remaining a Sacramento King makes sense. But a big part of this too is Malik's NBA journey, which has not been easy. He took a extremely bargain contract to come here to Sacramento. And now this is his opportunity to really cash in. His value is never going to be higher than it is right now. As much as I would be sad to see Malik go, there is not a single part of me that would blame or be upset at Malik for chasing the bag if he got offered it elsewhere. He is entitled to that, his journey. He has earned that with his play here in Sacramento. I just hope the way the Kings have treated him, the way the Kings have allowed him to express himself and be himself and become the best version of himself, in addition to all those other things that I laid out, it makes him want to stay here and and hopefully finish his career as a member of the Kings. We talked a lot about Malik today. I don't think we've mentioned one time Brody scored 17 points in 19 minutes last night. He's on one right now. He really he's is. And he's that's all he had nasty. to do. Like, he didn't have yeah. to do anything else. If he needed 25, he probably would have got that. I but guarantee- he didn't. The dunk was nasty. Oh. Come on now. I guarantee, the bell like that, but. <laughs> I guarantee you, you also haven't mentioned, like, shout out Malik. He was fantastic. Harrison Barnes had 16 points in 19 minutes, and he did so on 66% shooting mm-hmm. from the field and 60% from three-point range. Yeah. Uh, Malik didn't have a boatload of assists last night like he normally does because Malik's goal was to score the basketball last night, clearly coming in off the bench. Uh, Harrison didn't have a bunch of rebounds. He had like two rebounds, I think. But that uber-efficient shooting from Harrison, especially on a night where you're getting eight rebounds from Keegan Murray, like if we're going to shout out Malik for that too, we got to shout out HB because he was super efficient last night on a very, very limited amount of work. So I obviously thought about it and just never put it in the notes. But HB shooting like 40% from three on the season. Yep. He's played real well in the last 27 games or so. Real quick before we get out of here, the madness has started. Dayton down 17 with seven minutes to go. Finish the game on a 24-4 to four run to avoid the upset over Nevada. Sorry about that. I'll talk about that and much more. CBS 13 tonight, 9 p.m. Oh, sorry. You did Matt. that now? <laughs> sorry, man. <laughs> Bro, what are you? Sorry, sorry to my guy. He's, he's sorry to my in guy. The ABC 10 studio. <laughs> well, screw me then. Wow. Oh, whatever. Well, well, you'll be seeing. You'll be, you'll be seeing Matt. No, no, well, no, it's cool. Don't worry about it. I'm going to watch both. No. I'm going to watch both. No, nope. Matt. We got The Bachelor. Come on over and watch The Bachelor over here if, if you want. I don't care. I'm going to watch uh, both, man. I'm, I'm so sorry, man. The dirtiest player in the game. <laughs> Kenny wow. Rick Flair in the 80s right here. Goodness. <laughs> well, we got to go. Hey, we got to go. Matt George, I'm sorry.